Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our lecture on upward mobility in the Mountain West. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West, so welcome on behalf of my colleagues, Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino. You're in for an entertaining evening. Thanks, as always, to our hardworking Greenspun College crew who's helping record the lecture for us. Uh, Richard will have a PowerPoint to go with his lecture. That's already up on our website, so don't feel that you'll be missing a data point or two. Uh, enjoy the lecture, and you can always refer to that uh, at your leisure. We welcomed Richard here for the first time uh, almost a year ago to the day, and he gave his first talk on this book with the exquisite title, if I can see if I can get it all in one breath here, <laughs> Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust, Why That's a Problem, and What to Do About It. I commend this to you. This uh, book is, was the Economist Book of the Year, uh, the Guardian Book of the Year, uh, and Richard gave his first lecture here on it, which not surprisingly is our most popular lecture. It's had close to 13,000 downloads just in one year. Uh, I, I will go out on a limb and say he might be a better speaker than writer, which is saying something in his case. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about Richard, uh, give him a slight formal introduction. He's a senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings and co-director of the Center on Children and Families. His research focuses on social mobility, inequality, and family change. Prior to joining Brookings, he was director of, st of strategy to the UK's deputy prime minister. I mentioned his, public his most recent publication in this book. Uh, that and his other work led Politico in September of 2017 to list him as one of the top 50 thinkers on these topics. I would have put him a little higher than top 50. He's, 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 we're thrilled to have him back here. He has spent this week, and I know a number of people in this room have or will have him in a class, uh, but I'm thrilled to welcome back Richard Reeves. some of the uh, attention that the book Dream Hoarders got. And as you say, it was actually in this auditorium that I first uh, articulated publicly the argument in the book uh, before it was published. At the time, uh, I was here last time, it had just been, become available for pre-order on Amazon. And so I was using it as an opportunity to try and get one to pre-order the book. The book is now out. Uh, it's been out for some time. Um, and if I was you, I wouldn't buy the hardback now because the paperback's coming out soon. And that'll be much cheaper. The Kindle edition is also pretty cheap. Um, and if you don't want to read, but you'd rather listen, then there is an audio book version. Brookings has never done an audio book version before. There is now an audio book version. I, re I read the book myself, um, but in order to read the book myself, I had to pass an audition. I had to be auditioned for the part of reading my book. Um, given that the book is about me, and it's about partly about my British background and my, Amer and my journey to America, they, if I hadn't read it myself, they would have had to cast a British person to read my book about being a British person in America. So I was thrilled to pass the audition of playing the role of myself, <laughs> uh, and then read the book. So it's now on audiobook, as the paperback's uh, coming out soon, uh, too. And thank you for mentioning the, some of the attention it got. And the Politico 50 list was uh, the top 50 thinkers on, on whatever issue. So it includes people like Steve Bannon as well. He's on the list. So you, know, you can sort of choose your company carefully. <laughs> Um, but there was a party where at least all the Politico top 50 got to hang out. Um, whether or not you ha want to hang out Steve Bannon is another matter. Um, and I must say though, that the Politico 50 list of the most influential thinkers in the US is always a list that in previous years I have thought was a stupid list. Totally arbitrary and subjective. Clickbait nonsense. But I must say the 2017 list really <laughs> seemed to nail it with some exceptions, but I was very proud to be on the list this year. You know, you're not, these lists are usually rubbish, useless, pointless, but just occasionally they get it right. <laughs> uh, and this year they did. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, kind of Dream Hoarders is coming out soon. So last year I talked about Dream Hoarders and I talked about my journey from the, the UK to US and I held up my, my US and uh, British passport. How, hands up who was here last year who, who sort of saw it. So yeah, so you kind of saw me doing that. So you've already heard me 
point out that I became a US citizen just in time to vote in the presidential election. And as I was still a UK citizen, I was able to vote in the Brexit referendum as well. So it was a banner year for me politically <laughs> in 2016. Um, now, I, and I've spent much of the last uh, six months or so on the road talking about dream hoarders to lots of different audiences, public audiences, academic audiences, scholarly audiences, uh, think tank audiences, and sort of testing out some of the arguments. Um, but it was here that it had its first outing. Um, so I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about Dream Hoarders even before it was published um, and even before uh, the Brookings Press had put it out. But today I'm going to do something slightly different. Um, today I'm going to use my time to, to really zoom in on this issue of upward mobility, not uh, as a national issue or an international issue, but as a metro issue and specifically as a mountain metro issue and not only that but a mountain metro college issue. And so I'm going to be zooming the lens right in. I start my work on intergenerational mobility at a national level and comparing the UK and the US. And in the, in the book uh, and in some of the talks, I, mean, I compare and contrast the UK and US class system. So I talked a bit about this last year. I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. But I, but I can't resist saying a little bit about the cultural significance of class in the UK. Right? Everyone's very interested now in the royal family because Meghan Markle's marrying into it, and that's very exciting. Uh, everyone loves the crown and Downton Abbey and all these kind of movies about the British class system, right? It's fun, isn't it? Imagining a world where there's kind of hereditary inequality. But it's not fun growing up in a country where there's hereditary inequality. And I've spent much of my policy life trying to promote social mobility and trying to help people from different class backgrounds to not have that background determine their outcomes. And, uh, and that's partly a personal story, some of which I've told before, but uh, I haven't told all of it. I haven't told this story before, which is... In the book, I tell the story of my mother you know, forcing us to go to elocution lessons so that we spoke properly uh, and wouldn't be inhibited from upward mobility because of the way we spoke, because how you pronounce your words is very important in the UK. And if you start dropping your T's, for example, and saying butter and better, then you then you're immediately identify yourself as from a working class background. And because we were from a working class town and working class high school, there was a lot of dropping of T's going on. And so my mother would threaten us with what we wittily called electrocution lessons. <laughs> my mother also uh, forced my brother and I to learn how to ballroom dance. My mother was convinced that our ascent up the British class ladder was going to come to a halt at some point in the distant future where we're at some kind of event, a corporate event, and there's dancing and people are like dressed up, and that the boss would say, will you take my wife for a spin around the dance floor? Or something like that. My mother watched a lot of television. <laughs> and that we would have to be, say, well, no, because I don't know how to do it. Or we'd try and do it, we'd tread on her foot or something, and it would just be this mortifying social experience. And that that would mean we didn't get the promotion that we so badly served. So for a miserable year of my adolescence, I spent every Saturday morning wearing shiny shoes and trying to learn how to waltz and cha-cha and rumba. And when I went back recently, uh, the Observer extracted my book and they told this story. And I, went, I happened to see my parents that weekend. And my mother said, that's not true, this thing about me making you do ballroom dancing lessons. She said, that's not true. And I had a moment of thinking, Am I losing my mind? <laughs> I distinctly remember it. I said, I think it is true. <laughs> and so I went upstairs to the box and got all my kind of stuff out. Sure enough, there are the certificates from the Peterborough Ballroom Dancing Academy. Waltz, level one. Rumba, level one. Foxtrot, level one. Nothing above <coughs> level one, actually. So I presented this evidence, and faced with this evidence, she was forced to admit that it had been true, and that for a year she'd just forgotten that. It's amazing how as parents, isn't it, you forget some things. You know, I'm planning to forget a whole bunch of stuff about my parenting in the way that she did. <laughs> the reason she, she was afraid, right, so as it turns out, so I um, went working class school, I became one of the first two people from my school to get to either Oxford or Cambridge, so I was very proud of that fact. I went to Oxford, uh, and I at least knew the basics of waltzing. I stopped dropping my T's, I was saying butter and better. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought I was doing pretty well. Uh, I thought I was ready, ready for my ascent of the British class ladder. And in the uh, first week in Oxford, a terrible incident occurred that marked me out as being from the wrong class, involving cheese. And what happened was, we're at a, an event at the, in the warden's lodgings. The warden who runs the college invites all the new students in and you say, have wine and cheese and, you know, it's very civilised. Um, and, and I... I cut myself some, some cheese, some brie, to put on some crackers with some grapes. Everything seemed great. And then I heard someone say, oh my God, he's nosed the brie. 
Hands up here who knows what nosing the brie is. Thank God for that. Oh, you know because you've been in my previous talks. So don't give it away. <laughs> uh, brie uh, is always, tri when it's presented, like, it's just triangular, right? So it starts circle, and you cut it into a triangle. So uh, you're, you're at an event social event, and it'll be in a triangle, okay? The way you have to cut the brie is you have to cut it on the sides so that it remains triangular in shape, even as it diminishes in size. It's down the sides, etc. I cut the point off the brie. <laughs> Cutting the point off the brie is known as nosing the brie, because it's no longer pointy, and immediately reveals you as not being from the right class background to have got into Oxford. I'm like, I didn't go anywhere near it with my nose. <laughs> it's my hands, not my nose. Um, so anyway, consider that, just in case you find yourself in a situation, some very practical advice right, for navigating the British class system. Don't nose the brie. <laughs> so there's my mother, she's taught us how to talk, she's tried to get us to, to dance and she didn't teach us how to cut cheese properly. So she got it wrong in the end. Um, anyway, so my investigation of that led to Dream Hoarders, which is a book that uh, has been referred to. And my work continues to be motivated around this idea that birth shouldn't be destiny and that you should be able to rise up the mobility ladder, which is a profoundly American idea. So I'm going to talk about that today, but as I said, I'm going to talk about it here. I'm going to talk about it in the Mountain West, uh, I'm going to talk about it at UNLV. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of the role of colleges in promoting up and mobility. So this is essentially the, the uh, outline of my talk. I'm going to argue that upward mobility is an American issue. And I hope I can persuade you of that fact, that the idea of upward mobility is profoundly American in its DNA. That it's a metro issue. That the dynamics around upward mobility largely play out at a metropolitan level rather than a national level. I'm going to argue that it's a mountain metro issue because as you'll shortly see, there are some interesting differences between the main mountain metros in terms of their levels of upward mobility. And then I'm lastly going to argue that upward mobility is a mountain metro college issue. So the college is in the mountain metros. So that's a story that I'm going to go through before I stop to take some questions. Let's start with this. The idea of upward mobility as an American issue. Right? I think most people would agree that it is, but I'm going to, I'm going to have some quotes from various dead old white guys um, and I apologise for that in advance, but I also say that part of the reason I like to do this is because I'm very interested in the changing nature of facial hair uh, among white guys <laughs> in US history. I'm endlessly fascinated um, by what happens to the facial hair, and I think if you stick with me, you'll see some interesting trends in facial hair uh, across this. So even if you're finding some of the other stuff boring, watch the beards and how they come and go. So this is uh, James Truslow Adams. He wrote a book called The Epic of America in the 1930s. And he wanted to call the book The American Dream. Because in his book, he describes the American Dream. And here's how he described it. I won't read all of it, but you can read it for yourself. But this is the key point. Each man and woman should be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognised by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. So right there in his book is his definition of the American dream. His publisher said, we can't call a book the American dream. Americans are too practical a people. They're, they're a practical people. They're not dreamers. They're not people who think in terms of dreams. Well, it turns out, of course, he was right, because no one remembers the name of the book, The Epic of America, but everyone's heard of the American dream, which is one of the ways that uh, he defined it. Um, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the US at the time was living up to that ideal, especially when it comes to issues of race, that hardly, hardly need saying. Um, but I'm saying it is at least there. So that's Adams. Uh, now you've got Horatio Alger. No beard, but serious moustache. <laughs> and Horatio Alger um, is one of the best-selling authors in American history. Hands up who's heard of the Horatio Alger story or the Horatio Alger ideal. You say, right, the idea of upwards mobility. He wrote, he churned these books out through the 19th century, um, which were essentially about boys from very poor backgrounds who, with the help of a kindly mentor, made it on in, uh, into the world to become a respectable gentleman. There's a huge market for this. And uh, I think as late as the year 2000, he was the fourth best-selling US author of all time. I think it was just behind Daniel Steele. Um, now, considering that all his books in the 19th century is a long time, it's pretty good, right, to be up there with the Daniel Steeles, because he just sold a heck of a lot of books, and a lot of them are still in, in print. Um, I will say, however, that Daniel Steele is a much better writer than Horatio Alger. I mean, his books are tr truly awful to try and read, are shockingly badly written. 
Um, but in this one's the most famous one is Mr. Whitney, who's the, uh, who's the kindly mentor that's going to help this boy's Ragged Dick. And Ragged Dick's his kind of most famous book. And he's a, he's a shoe shine boy on the streets of New York, but he wants, to, he wants to get better. And this is what Mr. Whitney says to him. In this free country, poverty in early life is no bar to a man's advancement. There was quite a lot of work going on in there. Free country, poverty in early life, so many come from, there's no bar to advancement. Okay? But not only that, but Mr. Whitney has some specific advice for the shoeshine boy. Save your money, my lad. Buy books and determine to be somebody. Right there, you've got some of the ingredients of upward mobility. Save your money, financial capital, assets, wealth. They are important for upward mobility. They're a buffer against downturns and they help you to invest in your future. Buy books. Well, that's as a proxy for education, for human capital, which turns out to be hu very important for upward social mobility. And determine to be somebody. Aspiration, optimism, agency, a sense of your own future. So right there in Horatio Alger, you've got a sense of what this idea of the American dream was. The thing is that if we define uh, mobility or the American dream as the opportunity to rise Horatio Alger style from the bottom of the income ladder to the top of the income ladder, the US doesn't do so well by comparison to other nations. So first of all, ignore the green to start with, because that's the cities I'm going to come to. I'll just look at the bottom ones here. This is the percentage of people born into the bottom 20% who make it into the top 20%. So they rise from the bottom to the top Horatio Alger style. 8% US, 9% UK, 12% Denmark, 14% in Canada. So it turns out the American dream is alive and well, just in Canada. <laughs> the, wrong bit of no, the wrong bit of America. Or the right bit of America, if you're Canadian. I'm not biased. <laughs> but I've noticed that it quite galvanizes Americans to tell them that Canadians are better at something than them. Um, so you do see these kind of very big differences in just that specific measure. And then, uh, and to kind of give a teaser of what I'm going to be talking about in a moment with the metros, we've put up, because so there's huge variation within the US, some of the outcomes for the, the four big metros within the US. So what you'll see is that Salt Lake City which is which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit, which is a standout in terms of upward mobility, looks a lot like Denmark. <coughs> and so in terms of its upward mobility, it can, it can, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Scandinavian country. The, others, uh, the other big metros, uh, the mountain states, are more tracking against kind of US average, UK kind of average. But as I'll go on to show, that's actually a formidable achievement for some of those metros, given where they start. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the idea of the mindset, because this idea of the American dream and mobility is as much a mindset as is a material outcome. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of what I think is what constitutes the mindset of mobility. Um, and I think it consists of these three key elements. First of all, the idea that status isn't inherited. Right, so I've already referred to this idea of inherited status, and you don't get that. Instead, you make something of yourself. Secondly, this idea of owning the future, of being forward-looking. And thirdly, this idea of movement, expansiveness, et cetera, what you might call the frontier of the mind. So this idea that it isn't, uh, it isn't inherited, it's right there from the beginning too. This, another dead old white dude, Thomas Jefferson, no facial hair. Interesting. You see, there wasn't much facial hair then, and then there was facial hair, and then there wasn't, and then there is again. <laughs> this is a famous sentence from, where does it say that all men are created equal? And he drafted it. Yes. But that's not what he actually wrote. That's what turned out to be published. What he actually wrote was this. Hold this truth to yourself, Evan, that all men are created equal and independent. That was edited out during the process of revising the document. But in Jefferson's original draft, it said, are created equal and independent. And so the Declaration of Independence wasn't just a declaration of uh, the independence of one country, my new one from my old one. It was also a declaration that each American would be independent. This idea of individuality and of independence underpinned the American project from the very beginning. So even though the words were edited out, I think that the feeling kind of remains. And I've, you know, I've, asked some, I've written a couple of articles about what does it mean to be American, and I decided that the quintessential American phrase was, she or he, she's really made something of herself. She's really made something of herself. And every single one of those words is quite important in American context. She'd made something, but of what? Of herself. So people brag about being self-made woman, self-made man, and they mean that kind of materially. But in some sort of profound sense, actually, that is partly what it means to be American, which is to be, se be self-made, to be self-created, to decide for yourself what kind of life you want to live, to have that strong sense of independence. So to that extent, the most important manufactured American products 
are Americans themselves who are deciding for themselves what, it, what they want and who they want to be. Okay? Self-made. Secondly, this other kind of part of the American mobility mindset is a sense of the future, of optimism, agency, entrepreneurialism, a bit of risk-taking, etc., but very much a future orientation. Americans are intrinsically thinking about the future, less about the past. There's a future orientation around it, and, think, and, and an optimism, a sense of, well, things are going to get better, we can do this. You know, if we invest, we're going to think, I, I, I can get... So optimism is hugely important. However, optimism, particularly among the US middle class, is falling quite dramatically. So this, for example, is a percentage of those who are in the middle class. The middle class here is defined by Pew as those between two-thirds and twice the median national income. And that will come up again later. And it's just asking them, do you think it's uh, harder or easier for the middle class to maintain the standard of living today than it was 10 years ago? And what you see is a really kind of profound pessimism about how hard it is to maintain a middle class lifestyle among the American middle class. And that drop in optimism is potentially quite threatening to the idea of the American dream because if people start to become less optimistic about the future, they don't invest so much in the future, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, there's one reason why they might be feeling a bit less optimistic about the future, and this, uh, this, take, this chart takes a little bit of explanation, but I believe it's worth it because I think in a single line, it tells you a huge amount about what's happening in the world that we live in today. It's been dubbed the elephant chart because of the shape. Look at the trunk, look at the shape. It looks like an elephant, right? And it's, combined, and it's devised by Branko Milanovic, now at CUNY. I will, I'll, I'll explain what the line is, first of all. So across the bottom here, you've got the whole global income distribution, from the poorest people in the world to the richest people in the world, split up into uh, slices, uh, e equal size, 20 of them, bentiles. Right? So the, this is like the poorest 5%, 10%, et cetera, across the whole world. Okay? That's what is there. On the left-hand axis, is, and I've lost the percentage, is percentage income growth for each of those groups between, two th between 1988 and 2008, adjusted for purchasing power and inflation. So over those two decades in the run-up to the recession, what was the income growth like for people at different points in the global income distribution? And so what this chart is telling me is a number of things at once. It's telling me that there was quite a bit of income growth, especially in the middle of the global income distribution. So if you think, of, if the globe was a world, the middle class had a pretty good run of it for those 20 years. That's very, very robust income growth. Seven, 60, 70% real income growth during that period, right? That's pretty big for that period. Global middle class, China, India, big Asian countries where people saw big income growth during that period. A bit less for the global poor, down here at the bottom, but still, the result of this was to dramatically reduce global poverty levels, to halve, halve poverty levels at least. Right? So then you see this really good news story. Over here, you have a different story. So these are people are in the top fifth of the global income distribution. All right? And these bars, and then you can see, it, so they had a tougher time of it. That is the Western middle class and working class. That is those until the middle and the bottom of the income distribution of the UK, the US, Western Europe, etc. And then the top is the global rich, who are predominantly in those countries too. The shaded areas tell you what proportion of each of these uh, data points is comprised of people from advanced economies, US, Western Europe, etc. And so if you want to know how well the global economy delivered real income growth over those 20 years, you have to think, decide who you care about. It turns out that it delivered magnificently for a huge number of people in the world, especially for the middle class and those who are in the emerging economies of Asia. It did pretty darn well for those right at the top of the distribution, the top 10, 15%, 20% of the US distribution who Dream Hoarders is about. What it didn't do was deliver really any significant income growth for everybody below that level in the entire Western world. So the middle class and the working class in Western economies have seen the lowest income growth of anybody in the world over those two decades. Some of these people are angry about that and looking for someone to blame. Could be the rich, if it's Bernie Sanders, could be China, if it's President Trump. It could be immigrants. 
could be trade, but sure as hell they're looking for someone to blame, right? They're angry. And looking at that chart suggests that we have a political economy issue there because the power that's wielded by that group in those societies can change the entire architecture of our global trading system that has created so much wealth for so many people in the world. The world economy has been magnificent for the global middle class, but it's been pretty terrible for the Western middle class. And I think the consequences of that can be seen in Brexit and in other populist movements. Lastly, this is the idea of expansiveness, growth, and movement, what I call the frontier of the mind, or I may have stolen that from somebody else, which is this idea that in the US, you move to opportunity. The US is a dynamic society. People will just go. They'll go somewhere else, lots of migration, geographical mobility from, from time immemorial. So here we go, Horace, Horace Greeley, who was the editor of New York Tribune, um, said, go west, young man, and check out his hair. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, so it's not a moustache or a beard? It, what, what? What is going on there? <laughs> I told you, that's fascinating to me, really fascinating. It's like a ruff of hair, isn't it? <laughs> I'm thinking about doing that. Anyway, go west, right? Move. So if you've got an economy that's struggling with your area, move somewhere else. Get the U-Haul, get the wagon, move. It's different in Europe. In Europe, factory closes in our town. We'd say, well, the factory's closed. Where are you going to bring me another job from? Because I'm not moving. I'm from here. The US is getting more like that. Uh, this is a chart using zero as its uh, base from 1981, and then the, the, the variation from that is actually the regression discontinuity, but essentially it's just the trend year on year of interstate migration in the US, people crossing state lines in the US, with that as the base year. Uh, and the authors of this work, the MBR paper, they do it with, con with controls for age and home ownership, and then they do controls for age, home ownership, skills, income, etc. And then the, uh, the black line is just without any controls. Actually, it doesn't make too much difference, um, and the trend is very clear. According to some estimates, the amount of interstate migration in the US has halved in the last couple of decades. So people just moving a lot less than they were, becoming more European in that sense of it not moving anyway. And that could be for good or bad reasons. Uh, we also see a decline in uh, business startups and some kind of uh, some uh, dimensions of business dynamism. Um, actually, some ri more risk aversion, ironically, especially in some cases around among millennials. And the recession has kind of hit that, so you're seeing some risk aversion. Actually, the people who are still moving and setting up businesses are immigrants. Immigrants are twice as likely to start a new business now as, as someone who was born here. They are significantly more likely to move to opportunities, and their children seize educational opportunities much more firmly than those who are born here. And so in that sense, new Americans are the true Americans. If you think those are American attributes, it's immigrants that seem to have them in abundance, not the people who are indigenous. So that's why I think it's an American issue and why I think the mindset matters. Now, I think it's a metro issue, and I'm going to show you a chart from Raj Chetty, and I'm going to be using quite a lot of Raj Chetty's data, because Raj Chetty has all the data. Raj Chetty, the Equality of Opportunity Project at Stanford, I'm sure many of you know his work, um, has all the IRS data, he's now got all the census data, and he's linked the IRS data to the census data, so we can now do analysis at census tract level by race, gender, age, everything. This is just the earlier work, which now looks very simplistic by comparison to his new work, and he uh, has a, a, a very good habit of sharing all the data online. It's obviously anonymized, it's not individual. Um, but all the, uh, all the charts are online, and all the Excel spreadsheets are online. So Chetty's team make the data really, so those who are interested in research, it's all there. This is a map of social mobility in the US. This uses a slightly different measure of mobility. This is the rank-rank correlation, um, with high being bad for mobility. So in other words, that's what's the relationship between your parents' income and your income as an adult? How tight is that correlation? So the tighter the correlation, the more I can predict mobility from your parents' income, i.e., there's not much intergenerational mobility. So the darker red shows less mobility. So you can see in the south, some of the kind of Midwest, much less mobility, much, much better over towards the west. Newer cities, uh, frontier cities have got higher rates of upward mobility, which you're going to get into. But the key point is those, de those charts I showed you earlier with US mobility rates, kind of silly, because the US is a really big place and a very diverse place. And now we know that there are massive differences between different areas. Chetty then looks at kind of some of the correlations, what correlates in those different areas. And he, here we're using commuting zones. I'll mostly be using commuting zones today. Um, what's correlated with it? You can have a look at that. We can just read what Raj, here he is, 
what Raj has to say about it, the spatial variation in intergenerational is strongly correlated with five factors. So this is a correlation. What predicts less or more upward mobility? Residential segregation, by race especially, income inequality, school quality, social capital, and family structure. Those are the five big correlates that Chetty finds, the things that predict more or less upward mobility. Now, what this means is, and again, this is kind of a lesson from Chetty, is why are some areas in the US have higher rates of mobility than others? The main lesson of our analysis is that intergenerational mobility is a local problem. And by that, he means the metro problem. Such is the variation. We have to try and understand that variation and figure out what is it about some cities that means that their mobility performance is better than others, especially given their starting point. Just to kind of put, it, put uh, some more specific numbers on it, this is actually a measure of what's the impact for a, a kid who's poor, in this case 25th percentile, close to the federal poverty line. Um, so you've got someone who's about that level. What's the impact of growing up in Baltimore? This is Baltimore City now, so I've switched to the city level. Um, on their lifetime earnings, controlling for everything else. So I'm controlling for all the individual characteristics that I can, or rather, Raj Chetty is. And here's the impact. And it turns out that growing, the mere fact of growing up in Baltimore dings the, like, the uh, adult earnings of boys who grow up there by about 28%. That's a non-trivial impact on your earnings by comparison to what you should earn, given everything else we know about you, and the national income. Interestingly, no statistically significant impact on girls. Again, you sometimes need to add gender to the analysis because growing up in Baltimore is bad for boys, but neutral for girls. So you might want to think, if you're a policymaker in Baltimore, that's useful information in terms of how you construct policy. So I've tried to say very quickly that it's a metro issue. Now I'm going to get really gritty and into the data. And I apologize, there are quite a few charts. and There's a lot of data on these charts, but I'm a Brookings scholar. I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> I just did apologize. I, I'm not really apologizing. What I'm saying is tough. I use charts to explain to my family how my day went. <laughs> it's a mountain metro issue, not just a metro issue. So now let's put up, this is uh, expected income. This is from kids from the 25th percentile. It's one measure of mobility. They're all, they all basically find the same for the 50 biggest commuting zone areas in the US, from highest to lowest. I'm doing quite a lot of work with Charlotte at the moment because Charlotte came last and have set up an opportunity task force to try and figure out why, and they're really upset about it, because Charlotte's quite prosperous, and yet look at it down there. Um, but then what we put in is kind of four big mountain metros by commuting zone, Salt Lake City, ta-da! Highest rate of upward mobility of any commuting zone city area in the US. And then I put in Denver and Phoenix and Vegas that are basically grouped in the middle. So not too bad, not too great. What's happening in Salt Lake? Let's go find out what's happening in Salt Lake. I bet you've got ideas. You've got thoughts, right? Have a guess. Why does Salt Lake have such upward mobility? Just shout it out. Mormons. Schools? Mormons? <laughs> Anybody else? Mormons. Mormon schools? <laughs> huh? Marriage? marriage? Mormon marriage? <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. We're gonna, I, I've actually got data on it, but it's much more fun to get you to guess. Uh, and you guessed correctly. Right, so you know, look at those four. Now, I've said like, Vegas is kind of in there, and you might be like, well, 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 you know, we're not as high as we could be, which is true. But I'm going to argue that Vegas does surprisingly well considering a few factors about Vegas. And here my comparison is going to be those big four mountain metros, sometimes against the US. And bear in mind those Chetty correlates for what tends to predict upward mobility. So let's go through some depressing stuff first. First of all, Vegas has more people in that bottom quintile, because the bottom quintile is defined by national income, than the other mountain metros, and twice as many as in Salt Lake. So there's just more poor people here to start with. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't be upwardly mobile, but it's just you've got a kind of critical mass of lower income people here that Salt Lake doesn't have, for example. So that's one factor. What else? The school system here uh, doesn't seem to be producing quite the same results as you would wish. These are where percentile rank on national standardized uh, tests uh, with controls for income. So it's not explained by the income distribution, it's controlling for income, 
and then where are you? Now, there's, you know, there are problems in all of them, but Vegas is really, really not performing well at all on these national standardized test score results out of its public school system. Right? I'm not telling anybody here stuff they don't know, but it's just kind of in the data. So you've got, that's two things. The social capital index, which Chetty uses based on Putnam's work, is stuff like voter turnout, filling out census, involvement in community organizations. There are other proxies too. Again, Vegas is really not doing very well by comparison to the US average or even to next to some of the others. Another measure of uh, social capital is percentage of the population that's religious. Yes, <laughs> you were right about Salt Lake. <laughs> it's extremely religious, 70% um, religiosity rate. Vegas, not so much half that rate, and way lower than the US average, as are actually Denver and Phoenix, but, but Vegas is even lower than that. So not so much religion here. And religion does predict, religiosity does predict upward mobility. Um, reasonably high rates of single motherhood, not spectacularly different, but again, Salt Lake City is really low. So the story about Salt Lake City is becoming clearer um, as to why they're doing so well. But so far, all of these uh, variables have actually pointed the wrong way for Vegas. So on the basis of all this so far, we would expect Vegas to be much lower on the mobility chart than it actually is. Because there's a lot going against it, at least according to these figures. Also, there are fewer colleges in the Mountain West than in the uh, US average. This is per colleges per capita, which is why it's such a weirdly low number, because this is per kind of capita. And this is kind of a reflection of the, uh, the just how new these cities are and how quickly they've grown. So in the older, more established cities, there's more colleges for people, right? But still here, you've got kind of fewer colleges. Um, and so again, that would seem to make it kind of harder to get the upper mobility rates that you'd otherwise expect. And again, Vegas is right at the bottom, even among the Mountain West. So then what explains the relatively strong rates of upward mobility given all that, right? So I'm not gonna claim that, uh, that Vegas is like right up there on the top of Salt Lake, it's not, but I kind of can see what's happening in Salt Lake. It's harder to explain that Vegas isn't much lower given everything I've just said. So there must be some other stuff happening on the positive side for Vegas. And here, I'm just going to share some data with you. It's hard to know causally what's going on. So what's going on? Well, one thing that's just worth pointing out, although I can't explain, say this is causally related, is just to point out the level of racial diversity in Vegas. And I'm going to talk about the diversity of its diversity in a moment. But just for interest, you can sort of compare what, what kind, what's the racial composition of these, of these big. Salt Lake, very white. So in that sense, it actually is quite like Denmark because um, it's quite racially homogenous. Um, Vegas is much more, um, a, as are the other mountain metros, but, but clearly of all the major mountain metros, you're seeing much greater racial diversity in Vegas. Now that in and of itself doesn't necessarily predict anything, but the nature of that diversity uh, and where it comes from, I think might predict, because it seems to be suggestive of more dynamism, more migration, uh, less segregation, more fluid boundaries between racial categories in Vegas, which I'm gonna try and prove. Uh, and this thanks to Bill. Bill pointed me to this, which is, I think is from Fortune magazine or so, some uh, journalist kind of put together this quite neat chart, which says, given that we know roughly what the racial composition of the US is going to be in 2060, based on some assumptions, which cities look most like that now? And Vegas is at the top. So Vegas, uh, their, their similarity figure is 86%. The basic message here is that Vegas looks pretty much today what the US will look like in 40 years time. So in that sense, Vegas today, US tomorrow. So it's quite a good predictor in that sense of what's going to go on. Now, the, the interesting thing uh, about the racial diversity is not necessarily the level of racial diversity, but kind of where it comes from, right? And in terms of population growth. And what you're seeing is that the, pop, the source of the population growth in Vegas is being driven much more by racial diversity than it is in, uh, in the other. Uh, I mean, Phoenix to an extent too, but Vegas is a real standout for the fact that the sources of income growth are much less likely, not coming from white, they're coming from non-white and Hispanic, and of course you've got huge, pretty good population growth. This one absolutely fascinates me, I've only just discovered this from Pew Research. This is the percentage of people, marry, newlyweds, marrying across race lines in these metro areas. This is people who got married between 2011 and 2015. And just to be clear, this is not people who flew into Vegas, got married and flew out again. This is people who are here, right? <laughs> They're in the census here for those years and, and who say that they have gonna marry from a different race. So you can see that Vegas is twice the US average for interracial marriage and some way above the other mountain metros too and so you're a long way ahead of Salt Lake. And of course that's a reflection of the racial diversity but it's a reflection of something else too. It's a reflection of more of a kind of melting pot type city 
where it's not just that there are more diverse races, but I find I actually like interracial marriage as a good proxy for the degree to which the, li the, li the lines are, less poor, are more porous than they are in other places. And that might in and of itself be suggested there's less segregation, which there is, and more dynamism, which there is. And then last, and again, most, many of you in the room will know these figures, but this is kind of looking at kind of where, what's the net in migration? And these are quite old numbers. I, I think I may have mislabeled that. No, that's correct. But the, but the pattern hasn't changed. Um, which basically, so the black is in migration from outside the US to these metro areas. Sorry, wrong way around. Blue is from outside the US, from abroad. And the black is migration from within the US. And you can see across those big four mountain metros that the similar level of migration from overseas, from elsewhere, but dramatically different from within the US. And Salt Lakes is actually net negative. Okay, so, there's a, so there's much less kind of inward migration. And you've seen earlier that the population growth is more diverse. And now you're seeing that that's, you can put that together and see it's a result of this really kind of strong drawing in of net migration. So I showed the chart earlier about interstate migration. Quite a lot of this is interstate, but a lot of it from California and similar places. But nonetheless, what you're seeing is this kind of very strong in migration. So these are immigrants in the national sense or on the international sense, and therefore bringing with them more of an immigrant mindset. And then the next thing is, and here I'm using the Pew definition of middle class again, which is between two thirds and twice the median, which is what percentage of adults are in the middle class in those metros. And here Salt Lake does really well. Um, now we saw earlier that it had, a lot, it had a lot fewer poor people. And Salt Lake's income distribution is, quite, is pretty compressed in the middle. But so is Vegas. And so for one reason or another, actually Vegas is managing to create quite a chunky middle class. There's quite a, a significant kind of proportion of people in that, the middle of that distribution. Doesn't mean there aren't some super rich people at the bottom and there aren't poor people at the bottom at the other end, at the top and the bottom, but there is a decent size middle class. You can get a middle class income in Vegas. And you can't have upward mobility into the middle class unless there's a middle class to be upwardly mobile into. I'm nearly done. Uh, housing. Thanks to the bot. This I'll do very quickly. Um, <coughs> housing's getting really expensive in the US by comparison to median incomes. Why? because of growing land use regulation. This is since 1940, how many cases include land use regulation? That makes land really, really expensive. And what you don't want to do is do what LA did, which in 1960 was zoned for 10 million people when it had 2.5 million people in, and is now zoned for 4.3 when there's only four in there. It was 25% full in 1960, it's 92% full now, and we were right in 1960. There's plenty of room in LA. It's just that the zoning regulations at a local level have shrunk to fit the current population, driving up the cost of land and making housing unaffordable. And so all metros that are growing need to be constantly thinking about housing affordability and the role of zoning. It's a mountain metro college issue. OK. I'm going to do a comparison between UNLV and University of Nevada, Reno. I realize there's some sort of sporting event going on between those two. But that's not what my interest is in here. This is the median individual income of a graduate from the two institutions. Here's UNLV, there's Reno, a little bit more from Reno, four, three, four thousand more. Go Reno! <laughs> However, there's a big difference in the student body. I'm now going to show you the median household income of the parents. So of the median student, what's the household income of the parents? Uh, and so what you're seeing is a quite a big difference in the background incomes of those who are at Reno versus UNLV. And so if, if your test is, look, where are people coming from and where do they end up, then the comparison between the two bars is what counts. And it's why UNLV scores better than the University of Nevada, Reno, on an upward mobility metric, according to Chetty and others, because it's taking in more. And I'm going to show that in a bit more detail now. Again, UNLV versus uh, University of Nevada, Reno. This is showing you the percentage of students who are from the top fifth of the income distribution in green, from the middle 60, and then the bottom 20. So look, you only taking 7% of the bottom 20. You might, you might think that's not as high as you'd like. But by comparison, Reno's only taking four. And more importantly, Reno's taking 45% of its students from the top 20% as opposed to your 31%. So you know, <coughs> middle class college, look at this, this number 62 of those who are taking from the middle. UNLV is becoming a bit more middle class over time. This is based on birth cohort year, so people who were born in 1980 through to 94. What percentage of them are now? It's a slightly different metric. This is Chetty's bottom 60, 
top 20, top 10. And actually UNLV is serving somewhat more from the bottom 60 and somewhat fewer from the top 20 and 10. That's not true for the University of Nevada, Reno, where the lines are basically flat. Let's put all of the colleges and some of the big mountain metros up on the chart. So I've already shown you, so the, this is the UNLV school, right, median outcome, parental background. Here's UNR, median outcome, parental background. Over here on the left, the kind of Utah and Boise and University of Mexico, you've got weaker outcomes generally, you know, down in the 30s, which is clearly a reflection of kind of what's going on in those kind of metro areas. So I draw your attention to this part of the chart where you've actually got pretty similar outcomes. You know, the median, they're not particularly different, they're in the 40s, it's a median outcome. And then look at the top. What about the household income background of the median student at those institutions? And in every single one, of those mountain metro colleges, the median student comes from a household with a six-figure income. UNLV is the only one that doesn't have median household income with a six-figure outcome. So those are the sorts of comparisons we want to be doing, we're picking apart the fact that colleges can do it. This makes the same point. Remember the 62% from UNLV from the middle 60, etc. Now you can see all the rest. University of Utah takes 48% from the top 20. Colorado State takes 56% of its student from the top 20% of the distribution, and so on. That 62% is the highest of all the mountain colleges. It's, it's pretty high over here, too, for reasons that I just identified earlier. But in terms of kind of serving those middle-class kids, UNLV is in the lead. That's why it's a metro issue uh, and a college issue. So what I've tried to do, and I'm going to stop because I'm over time, for which I apologize, is to try and argue that mobility is an American issue, that it's a metro issue, that it's a mountain metro issue, and it's a mountain metro college issue. And it's quite clear that something's going on in Vegas to help it do a bit better than you'd predict. And some of that is about the role of post-secondary institutions in taking kids from more modest income backgrounds and helping them rise up the ladder. Also, more diverse, melting pot marriages, strong in migration, chunky middle class, but also institutions like this who appear to have made it more of a mission to be kind of serving those middle class kids and helping them move up the income ladder. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions, challenges, worries, concerns, tomatoes. Yes? So when you, how do you define income? Is that primarily earnings or is it you know, interest? Uh, it's, either, it's either income uh, or earnings, but in the charts that I was just showing, um, it's individual income for the, uh, in for the student, because what I need to know is what's that individual doing, right? I don't need to know whether they married someone rich. I need to know how they are doing. Um, but the household income for the parents is, how is it, the income of it is household income. That's why it's so much higher. Um, and then it's just a comparison across the two. It so constitutes it's, earnings. Yes. Earnings. We can safely assume that that individual income consists of earnings. Right. So it's not, it's not investment income or anything like that. <coughs> okay. So if you look at the, uh, the first uh, trend that you showed us, uh, global trend? Yeah, the other chart. Right. Um, so if you look at the top uh, in the distribution, yeah. I mean, what percentage really work get earnings? All of them. Or the, the top 20% of the US income distribution? Top 20, yeah. They're all but working. Above that. Well, on that elephant chart, the top 5% of the global income distribution, that includes the top 20% of the US income distribution, for sure. And they're working. In fact, they're working more. There are two earners in a lot of those households, which is why they've got high incomes. The, the inequality in the US is driven, up until this point, it's driven by labor market outcomes. It's driven by earnings inequality and two earners in those households. It's a labor market story. Okay. Yes, Rob. I had a question, UNR versus UNLV, so if I'm reading this <laughs> yes. right. All right, do you want the, other, the simpler one? That, the, just no, the one? that's okay. No, go back to that one. Okay. So if you double the, you know, let's say two UNLV grads married each other, they get ahead of their parents, basically. Yeah. Based on that. Yes. The UNR is just trending. Mm -hmm. It's just, so if the state wants to build the middle class in Nevada, UNLV looks like a better bet for mobility. Than you and ours. Is that fair to say? Well, uh, if, if the way that I'm thinking about mobility here is a kind of metric, which is, look, you're looking at the output and the input, okay? And if, if your goal is to take, to take those from more modest income backgrounds, right? And this chart 
and it does this in some ways even more dramatically by showing you kind of you know the percentages that are coming from from the kind of middle class um, and propelling them up the income ladder. So you take the input, what's the output? So you obviously want the output to be good. But it's dead easy to produce people who are going to go on and do well in the labour market if you only take affluent students or you take a disproportionate of affluent students. They tend to do better anyway. And so the mobility metric is what's the difference between it? What's the input uh, and then what's the output? And it sounds a horribly me mechanistic way to do it, but that's how mobility metrics work. And so that's why these, that's why these charts really matter in terms of like, thinking about you know, what's, what are the outcomes, but then what, you know, where's that coming from? Right? Because it's clearly a bigger lift to take people from more modest backgrounds and get them to the same point. Um, as it is for those other institutions. So that's why, and here there's, this, there's a mobility metric in the Chetty work, and uh, UNLV is ahead of UNR for that obvious reason, for the, exactly that reason. Yeah. Yes, there. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I, um, I, 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 on the website of UNLV, and uh, it says it's diverse and inclusive. Uh huh. And uh, I'm really surprised. Uh, that uh, you would spend a lot of time on facial hair of dead white males mm -hmm. uh, as if they somehow would be excluded from this environment. I assume it would be a lot different, no laughs or titters, uh, if in fact you talked about hair with regard to other races in this lecture. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of disappointed sure. with regard to that as you think it's a joke. Uh, what, the facial hair? Two, dreamers. They came here with their parents, no choice on their own, mm -hmm. and they want to stay here. Why would they want to do that based on what you presented? Why not go back to other places where things are better for economic and social mobility? And finally, like where? Sorry, I guess where, where would they go back to? And finally, and finally, well, maybe UK. Um, I guess. I don't think there are many dreams they, all they have to do is worry about not nosing the breed. In any event, the the uh, the other thing I wanted to ask uh, is in the when I read the advertisement for the lecture, and it was it was really uh, very well done. Uh, when I read the advertisement for the lecture, it talked about social mobility, uh -huh. and um, we seem to be uh, confusing social and economic mobility. Sure. Can you give me a definition of when somebody knows they have made the mm -hmm. step? Uh, that is, they can look back and say, you know, I, I've made it. I have gone beyond uh, where I was, and I'm now uh, a social step higher or an economic step higher. OK, so three things there. First of all, I apologize for any offense caused by my mocking of the facial hair of historical figures. Um, or dead white males? Uh, of, of the facial hair of dead white males? Yes. I apologize for any offense caused by mocking the facial hair of dead white males. Um, second point, I don't understand what you mean because the dreamers are typically from countries where the absolute levels of material well-being and upward mobility chances are dramatically lower than they are in the US. As you say, that's why they're here. So the reason they don't go back to where they've come from is because they're not from the UK and Denmark. I suspect that if you break down the dreamer population, you'll find very few from the UK and Denmark. Right? So you're just wrong empirically about what the mobility chances would be in the places they go back to. Thirdly, you're right about the difference between social and economic mobility. Uh, and it's a bit of an issue in the way the language is used. So although it talks about social mobility, and I talk about social mobility, I've presented evidence really for economic mobility. So I'm using economic mobility, income, earnings, largely income, as a proxy for social mobility. So according to my definition I've used today, you are socially mobile if you start in the bottom quintile of the income distribution and move up to the middle or higher. Now, is that social mobility? Well, that's a big argument, because some people would say, well, it's really about your occupational status rather than your income, or it's about cultural capital. It's about your sense. So there are, and there are real arguments about that that go on. Um, the thing is that it turns out that occupational status is so tightly correlated with income that actually one will pretty much do as a proxy um, for the other. There aren't that many high status people on very low incomes. 
Um, and so income actually does work pretty well. But you're right that technically speaking, it would be better to call it economic mobility and then say that's what I mean by social mobility as opposed to calling it social mobility. And that's a bit of an issue about the language here because in Europe it tends to be social mobility we talk about and the US more economic mobility. So I think that's a fair question. Behind you, yeah. Uh, I recently read a survey, and I don't think it was partisan, and it said a majority of the people that say they're Republicans think a college education is detrimental. Mm -hmm. but what does that mean for the future of the country? You're right. So that's the first time it's ever happened that the majority of people in the Pew survey um, said they thought colleges were damaging America. A majority of Republicans said they thought colleges were damaging America. Uh, and that is an extremely troubling finding. Uh, I suspect that that was a bit of a blip up um, because it was in, uh, in the year of the presidential election. There's a lot of stuff mediating around some of the free speech stuff on liberal campuses and so on. Um, but I do think it taps into something quite real, which is that actually for a lot of people who, uh, who are Republican, um, they are worried that higher education, college education, has been completely colonized by liberals. Um, and if they send their kids to those colleges, they're basically just sending them into a place where they're going to be brainwashed into liberal thinking. And it's actually empirically true that the faculty of, of colleges has become progressively more left over time. Um, and so there are fewer Republicans and fewer conservatives on most college campuses now than there were before. So there's some truth to that idea. And that's actually why I think it's very important to have heterodox opinion. There's an organization called Heterodox Academy that I'm a member of, where there are genuinely dissenting opinions between people who can respectfully disagree, as the gentleman and I just did. Because that's the whole point of being an institutional like this, is not to be, to be spoon-fed stuff to you know, equip you as a social justice warrior or you know, an evangelical Christian or whatever. It is exactly to challenge each other and say, I disagree with that or that's wrong or et cetera. Um, and so it troubles me. I actually then got them to break down the data by income. This hasn't been published yet. Because my prior was, it'll be lower income Republicans who are the ones that don't like colleges. It's not the case. It's slightly higher income Republicans that don't like colleges. And I'm still pondering on that a little bit. And I think it might be because they're very disappointed in the outcomes that they've seen college graduates have, or because of the liberal takeover point. I don't know. But I agree with you that uh, uh, institutions of higher education should be really worried about that finding. Because then it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. If Republicans become more reluctant to send their kids to colleges, they become more liberal. And one of the reasons they don't want to send their kids to colleges is because they think they're liberal. And then you're in real trouble. Then we're in real trouble if that happens. Yes, one at the back there. Um, <coughs> do you have any research on uh, generational uh, differences? For example, my grandfather was an enlisted man in the service. My dad was an officer in the service. When my grandfather retired, he got land in addition to his pension. When my father retired, I don't recall that he was offered any land uh, and if he was, apparently, for whatever reason, he didn't take it. I don't know anything about that specific case, I'm afraid. <laughs> I know there's not any land left to give away. But, um, yeah. it's, it's wrong with his own, yeah. Yes, definitely. Well, at the higher level, like, Republicans are fearing their kids going to colleges because um, they'll become, like, more brainwashed into becoming liberals. Then does that mean they're, like, a move for, like, the children of them? moving towards like more like smaller private schools or like online colleges yeah. or what, where are they trying to send them to? I don't know. I'm speculating about what lies behind that poll number. I'm really hoping it's going to come down again because I think it's bad for America if people who identify with one of its two major parties think that its institutions of higher education are damaging the country. Um, so I hope that it's going to come back down again. I know that the... The, the social media echo chamber of a lot of conservative thinking really is very hard, particularly on the elite colleges and kind of liberal colleges. So the sense that you get is kind of, it is kind of very liberal. You know, the political correctness stuff that they kind of, you know, they, so there are people who kind of come to believe that, that there really is a lack of free speech and an incredible degree of liberal brainwashing on college campuses. And of course, that's not true by and large, but a lot of people come to believe it, I think, through the way that some of these stories play out. I don't know, but I think it goes both ways too. There was some evidence that in the wake of the uh, uh, presidential election that um, those who were from liberal families on the coasts had become slightly less likely to send their kids to colleges in the states that voted for Trump. Um, and it's uh, and so, like, well, I'm not going to college there. <laughs> and so you can actually see that that polarization could take place in different places where people start 
segregating almost on ideological lines into post-secondary institutions that are aligned with their already existing beliefs. And you see that already in Christian colleges, for example. Um, and I think, that that was, I think that's extremely dangerous to democracy. There's so much segregation at every other level that if, if, if even on college campuses there, aren't, there isn't a plurality and diversity of views and dissent and collision of ideas, then God help us all if it just becomes a place where you go to be told what you already kind of knew, but now you've got some new facts to wield to support your existing priors, rather than being challenged in your beliefs and not making the mistake of confusing our ideas for our identity. You can attack my ideas, because for all I know, half of them are rubbish ideas, and I need you to help me find out which ones are rubbish. That's the whole point. But if you attacking my ideas comes across as an attack on my identity because those ideas are important to me and you can't say that to me, then we're in trouble. That's the whole progressive purpose of education and free speech. Yes? How much of an impact do you think that the low American savings rate has on social mobility? Um, it is relatively low, you're right, by international standards. The honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and so I'm not going to pretend to know. I wonder if you move from a debt-based education system to more of an asset-based one, whether that would reduce some of the cost of college and the sticker price effect that we see where people are put off college because of the apparent cost. That might help more low-income people to consider college. Uh, and so it's possible that moving more of a, to more of a, a savings-based culture than a debt-based culture would have an effect on social mobility. I don't know for sure because quite often credit and debt responsibly taken is what allows people to make the investment in their future. So actually if you take out a you know, decent loan to go to a college and graduate, that's almost always a good idea because the return on that investment is going to be high. Um, and so absent a huge shift in, say, the funding of higher education, it's going to be debt financed, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because otherwise only then the only people who will be able to afford to go are those who don't need to take out a loan, and that by definition is only the wealthy. So to that extent, we just need to get the debt structure right and the interest rate right. But I, I don't know overall, to be honest. Yes, there. Uh, so absolute wealth is, is you know, just a, a number, but do the types of jobs affect the earnings that you're referring to here? So obviously, you know, Logan, Boise, mm -hmm. Albuquerque, those aren't Las Vegas. Las Vegas is hospitality-based. Yeah. You can make a decent amount of money, you know, serving drinks or, you know, handing out cars. So does that affect the the numbers that we see here? Well, first of all, I think you're talking about income, not wealth. Y yes, sorry. Okay, well, that's uh, it. Because very often those terms are used interchangeably, and it's important we don't do that because they're different. Um, uh, so you're talking about income, and uh, as the earlier questioner, uh, I think, drew out of me, mostly here we are talking about the income does come from earnings. That is where most of the income is going to come from. So then the question is, where do you get that from? How do you get those earnings, and are they higher in some industries than others? So yeah, what you're seeing here partly is a reflection of the labour markets that those people are going into, um, and what occupations are in those labour markets, and what do those occupations pay? And I suspect there's a couple of things going on. One is that there are, somewhat, there are some higher paying occupations in the Vegas commuting zone area, but I also think there are some occupations that are paid higher than they would in another area because of the role of unions, collective bargaining, um, and the kind of strength of the, within the hospitality industry. I think they bargained up wages into middle class levels in a way that may not have happened somewhere else within the industries you've t talked about. So the correlation between occupation and, and earnings is not precise because you'll get these collective effects or you'll get kind of different power effects in different places. It may well be that actually if you get a job working in a hospitality, some hospitality job here, you're going to, I'm sure this is true, but someone might know, you're probably going to get paid more than you would doing the same job in another labour market where there isn't the same history of collective action. So you're right to point to it, um, but I don't know the precise answer. I just well, know that... I yeah. was, you know, we were mentioning uh, urban policy, right? Mm -hmm. So unions, you were just mentioning, might be one that, that yeah. helps the other mountain west regions or, you know, do, or do the other cities do more gambling and more, you know, that, that's what I'm trying to get at from a policy standpoint. Well, as somebody said in uh, the class I was in earlier, I don't know if she's here, she said, well, she thought the reason why people in Vegas did so well was because um, everyone's gambling and everyone's a winner. Um, <laughs> and so it's a direct result of, <laughs> of everyone beating the house. Um, uh, <laughs> seems unlikely, given the profit margins of the casinos. But anyway, um, uh, so, uh, I mean, essentially, you're right. I just don't, I, I don't know the answer is the truth. And I also think that... Um, it's very hard to find a way back to the sorts of union presence that we had in the past. 
So even if on theory you can kind of show it, and, and it's very hard to recreate it in new cities. I have to say that my, my view of the role of unions has become more positive in recent years, um, simply because the power relations within the labour market are so strongly tilted now against lower skilled workers in particular, that absent really strong full employment economy or other ways of empowering those workers, it's actually quite hard for them to bargain their wages up. You know, and so as someone who was kind of a sort of Blairite centrist, who was quite anti-union, I've come to actually see that absent unions, it's quite hard to know how lower skilled workers will be able to exercise power in the labour market. And it's not just about money, it's about things like your scheduling, your access to paid sick leave, your access to health leave, your access to time off with your kid, paternity leave, maternity leave, stability of your income, etc. A lot of the workers we're talking about don't know their schedules the following week if they're not well represented. And it's really hard to raise a family if you don't know when you're going to be working next week. Next week. And so I think issues around fair scheduling will be quite important too, as well as income. Yes, I just Rob. have one last question. Yes. Uh, if we ever drill down between you and our UNLV, this raises an interesting point. Can we separate private and public sector employment? Because public sector is a well tended to, but there's a public sector <laughs> unions. Mm. And a lot of UNR grads work in the state government. Uh, yeah, and so they are sucked into that government where they are privileged. Where you could beat, with a UNR degree, you could beat out Berkeley, you could beat out Harvard to get hired in that government. And is that some part of what's bumping UNR, even its I paltry don't. amount over UNLV, public sector? So I'm, I'm getting the sense that you've got horse in this race. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm just presenting that yeah. fact. But I'm asking if you could separate. We don't know. No. So the, if you could ever separate public sector and employment. No. Out. We don't, because the data upon which this is based, which is the Chetty data, um, and actually it's not that paper, it's the other one, um, the Chetty data is based on IRS records. So I know a lot about your income and wealth and so on, but you don't, when you file your tax return, you don't tell them whether you're a public sector or a private sector employee. And I don't know if there's any way to find out using that data. So you may be right, but it would require a different study than the one that the data allows us uh, to do right now. Oh, thank, you for the qu thank you for your questions. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We'll be back on April 4th with our next lecture. As I scan the room, a lot of you have a, a direct and immediate interest. We'll have Martha Ross out talking about employment and, and how the young, young labor market is changing. So hope to see you in uh, April 4th. You know, the other cities, Denver, they're all big government towns. If you think they're, about they're it, all state capital. They're all state capital.